Okay, this brings us on to the final part of chapter one, and that is corporate governance, ethics, and CSR. Okay, corporate social responsibility. I cannot emphasize enough how important this is for SEMA. Okay, they really put a strong emphasis on ethics, on corporate social responsibility, and good corporate governance practices. And this is not simply wishy washy stuff. Okay, this is really practical. That the idea is that the ethical principles that SEMA outlines can guide you in your real world application of your financial skills, your accounting skills. OK, so don't dismiss this as something that is just abstract. The idea is that this can be applied and the questions that SEMA asks reflect that they want you to be able to apply ethical principles, resolve ethical dilemmas, offer guidance on corporate governance and corporate social responsibility. OK, so let's get into it. Why is corporate governance important? I've already gestured at it, but specifically it has to do with two key ideas. The first being ownership and control. The separation of ownership and control refers to the situation in a company where the people who own the company, namely the shareholders, most commonly the shareholders, especially in large organizations, they may not be the same people as those who run the company the board of directors. It's a common mistake students make to assume that those who run uh, or control the company are the same as the people who own the company. But in many, if not most, uh, major companies in the world, you will find that actually there is a separation between those who control and run the company and those who actually own it. Owners tend to be the shareholders and those who control and run the company tend to be the board of directors. And then you have what's called the agency problem. And this is the risk that arises in this connection, the risk that the directors may run the company in their own interests rather than in the interests of the shareholders and other stakeholders as well. OK, we'll talk about stakeholders in general in Chapter 2. But here we're focusing really mainly on the relationship between directors and shareholders. And corporate governance is introduced in an effort to uh, reduce the conflict of interests or the potential for a conflict of interests between the directors on the one hand and the shareholders on the other. So corporate governance is the system by which companies are directed and controlled. It considers how directors can be held accountable to shareholders for their actions and activities within the organization. So here's a useful little diagram just to help you to schematize this visually. You have the company, OK, as a separate entity. It is owned by the shareholders and managed by or run by the directors. And corporate governance then is this mediating force between the directors and shareholders to ensure that their interests are aligned and that the directors are accountable to their shareholders. OK, so before we get into good corporate governance, let's talk about some examples of poor corporate governance and what can be done to prevent that from arising. Domination by a single individual is often considered to be a, an archetypal case of poor corporate governance. You don't want one person on the board of directors calling all the shots. The whole point of having a board of directors, of course, is to ensure balance, OK, balance amongst the different functions within the organization and make sure that one function isn't leading uh, or overriding the interests of other functions within the organization, because, of course, that will, in the end, potentially, if not more likely, compromise the uh, wealth of shareholders, OK, because it means that the organization is not balanced and you're not going to be able to create value easily if that's the case. Lack of involvement of the board, OK, so if you don't have active participation from all board members, that is considered uh, poor corporate governance. You want to ensure that everyone has a say. Lack of ad adequate control functions. We're going to be talking about control, especially in the next chapter. Lack of supervision, OK, lack of independent scrutiny. This has to do with um, committees of various kinds, which, again, we're going to be looking at in a few slides. Lack of contact with shareholders. OK, so poor communication with shareholders and not keeping them sufficiently informed about what is going on in the company. Emphasis on short term profitability. This is often an issue when it comes to poor corporate governance. Sometimes, for example, bonuses, if they're related to short term profitability, this can cause directors to think only in the short term or excessively think about the short term and not think about the long term value, sustained value of the organization. 
misleading accounts and information as well. Of course, there's a temptation sometimes within an organization to try to maximize the perception that profits uh, are increasing, okay, and to uh, try to present figures in as good a light as possible to shareholders. And that temptation can sometimes lead to less than honest reporting of the figures and indeed pressure on financial account, uh, financial uh, professionals as well. Okay, so how do we combat these potentials for poor corporate governance? The OECD has outlined some principles, general principles of corporate governance. And the idea of these principles is that they provide a, a potential framework for different nations, different governments, when it comes to implementing either guidelines or requirements, legal requirements for corporate governance. Okay, so there are a number of principles according to the OCD. The framework that the government imposes or the guidelines that they impose should promote transparent and fair markets within the, within the country. Okay, so they're thinking of it from a macro level there. The framework should protect and facilitate the exercise of shareholders' rights. Okay, so obviously protecting shareholders' concerns and interests is very important when it comes to corporate governance. The framework should provide sound incentives throughout the investment chain. Okay, so again, we're thinking of both the external and the internal perspective here. The framework that a government employs when it comes to principles of corporate governance, they need to ensure that there is adequate incentives to invest in organizations. In other words, you want to inspire confidence with the principles of corporate governance that you employ. The framework should recognize the rights of stakeholders established by law or through mutual agreements. Okay, so for example, there might be things like trade union laws in certain countries, and you want to ensure again that the corporate governance uh, principles do not contravene those kinds of rights that may be in place. The framework should ensure that timely and accurate disclosure is made on all material matters regarding the corporation. And then finally, the framework should ensure the strategic guidance of the company, the effective monitoring of management by the board and the board's accountability to the company and the shareholders. And that number six really just sums up the basic thrust of what co corporate governance is all about, as we covered in the previous slides. Now, the UK Corporate Governance Code is one of the most famous, one of the most well-known. It is a set of guidelines. For many companies, it is a, a voluntary set of guidelines. Okay, there is no legal requirement to employ these uh, corporate governance codes in your own uh, organization. But they are guidelines and they are recommended. And if you are going to list your company on the stock exchange, you do actually need to, as a requirement of that, have these corporate governance uh, principles employed, okay? We're gonna cover these in more detail as we go through today's session. So this code, the UK Corporate Governance Code, covers board leadership and company purpose, first of all, division of responsibilities within the board, composition, succession, and evaluation, audit risk and internal control, and remuneration, okay? So financial monetary considerations, okay? How people are paid and who makes decisions about the salaries, especially of the uh, board of directors, okay? So all of these are very, very important aspects of corporate governance, and we're going to uh, flesh these out as we go through the next few slides. Now, as I mentioned, all companies listed on the London Stock Exchange are required to apply the principles of the UK Corporate Governance Code. Now, there are two different approaches to corporate governance. Before I get into the details of the uh, UK Corporate Governance Code, there's a rules-based approach, and then we have uh, an example of that in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of Corporate Governance. This is legislation in the United States. And in the United States, okay, these are actually mandatory, regardless of whether or not you're listed on a uh, stock exchange, okay? So you don't have to be a public company. You are required to comply with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of Corporate Governance legislation in the United States. And that's an example of a rules-based approach. In other words, requiring uh, companies to uh, comply with these corporate governance uh, principles. Now, there are a number of advantages and disadvantages associated with uh, the rules-based approach. We'll start here with the advantages. Of course, it ensures consistent application that all companies are following the same corporate governance principles. Breaches are therefore relatively easy to identify. Okay, if you see one company deviating, it is quite easy to pick them out from the crowd. 
And then you've got rules as well for specific outcomes. Okay, so if there is a particular kind of activity and it's deemed to be a breach, then you will have very strong principles, clear principles about what the costs of what the penalties are for that breach of the rules. Disadvantages then of a rules based approach. It's costly to learn every rule. And of course, these kinds of legislation often are uh, quite lengthy. OK, there's lots of fine print and terms and conditions and so on. And of course, that can be costly for companies to investigate whether or not they're actually complying adequately with this kind of legislation. It removes the need for discretion. OK, so discretion becomes less of a factor when it comes to the strategic level of the organization, when it comes to the board of directors, for example, and uh, companies uh, like to have discretion when it comes to strategic matters and how they actually conduct themselves. So that is considered by some to be a disadvantage of the rules based approach. And as I said, those long and lengthy rule books, that can be a cost for the organization, both in terms of financial cost, because they might need to get legal advice, but also in terms of opportunity cost. OK, because, of course, spending time and internal resources on uh, dedicating it to trying to figure out what's actually in this legislation. Again, that is considered a disadvantage of the rules based approach. The framework approach then is what we see in places like the UK. OK, so UK Corporate Governors Corporate Governance Code is an example of a framework approach. In other words, these are voluntary guidelines for companies, uh, except if you want to get listed on the uh, London Stock Exchange. And in that case, you have to actually comply with these uh, principles. So the advantages then. The advantages of the framework approach, it encourages proactive actions on the part of the board of directors. So they have to actually really carefully think about corporate governance and what are the best practices in their particular case. So that uh, relates to this point, it treats members as individuals. In other words, of course, companies are all different and different sectors will have different needs and different requirements. And in that respect, it's more flexible. OK, it leaves that room for flexibility for uh, individual organizations to employ their own principles that are perhaps more suitable. So flexibility also helps in complex situations. OK, so if you have complex uh, markets, markets, of course, are very complex places. And as we'll see with ecosystems becoming more and more complex uh, as time goes by. And again, if you have a looser framework, OK, a set of guidelines, you give that flexibility that allows our organizations to adapt, cope and evolve to complex situations. And it's harder, of course, to search for loopholes. OK, so if there's strict rules okay that are set in place you might be able to employ for example legal advisors to find loopholes in those laws however if you're looking at all guidelines only you're not going to get those same legal loopholes and those opportunities for deception and duplicity and so on disadvantages of the framework approach interpretations can be subjective okay so you're looking at these guidelines and there's going to be a range of interpretations about what these guidelines mean, what they mean for a particular company, and the incentives to be objective are undermined because, of course, you're not going to be penalized if you have a loose interpretation of the guidelines. There's also that potential, of course, then for inconsistency. And so this is this corresponds to treating members as individuals. Of course, you're always running the risk with that kind of framework of having people acting in very inconsistent ways. There may be some ambiguity, OK, and that can, of course, be confusing when you have hard and fast rules. OK, when you have laws that are set in place and it's a, you're either right or wrong, that's obviously very clear. In this case, with guidelines, recommendations, you're going to tend to have more ambiguity, which may cause confusion and disorientation for the organization. And then guidelines, of course, there is a danger that they could become rules, OK? They lapse into rigid uh, rules and people forget that these are just guidelines. OK, so over time, because these kinds of principles like the UK Corporate Governance Code, they're taken as a given. People often then will start to think about them as hard and fast rules rather than just guidelines. And so they become excessively rigid and they kind of fall into the habit of doing things a certain way, even though the environment might not actually be conducive to it. So that's one of the potential disadvantages of the framework approach. So there's advantages and disadvantages associated with the rules based and the framework approach. But we're looking primarily here at the UK Corporate Governance Code as a example of a framework approach. We'll be going through that now in some detail.